Good morning, friends. This is Living Hope Church in Menominee, Wisconsin. I'm Pastor Brent Juliet. I welcome you to uh, worship with me this morning. This is the sermon portion of our uh, Sunday morning service for October 25th, year 2020. And uh, I will continue to record the sermon separately, at least, at least have been kind of week by week, and we'll see. Uh, as long as we get to the point and, and we're getting there rapidly where we don't have any more crashes with the live stream, it, it's, uh, that way you can enjoy the whole service. But this will be our backup, and if for whatever reason you've cho chosen to join me uh, to worship this way today, very glad to have you. I will also mention that our worship service uh, meets at 10.30, uh, physically at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays at our location in Menominee, and uh, I would encourage you to wear masks, but uh, if you are healthy, and, and would like to come and, and feel safe doing so, you're welcome to. We have room to, to uh, distance pretty well in terms of our worship together. Our text today is from Luke chapter 17. We're working our way through the Gospel of Luke, and this is uh, verses 20 to 35. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is or here he is. Do not go running off after them, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. When, when the, then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building but the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken, and the other left. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this uh, word, which is shocking and challenging, and I pray that you will help us to take to heart and accept what Jesus wants to teach us here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We never saw it coming. It was a beautiful summer day near Chatek, Wisconsin, so when we entered the restaurant, we asked the server if we could sit out on the deck close to the lake. Miles away, across Lake Chatek and far beyond the town of Chatek, we could see the clouds, but it was such a distance that there should be plenty of time to enjoy our meal. We, and the others on the deck that day, were, I would say, 99.8% confident that we would fully enjoy the occasion, that there was no danger. This is when, without warning, we felt the explosion and the simultaneous flash of brightness. What was that? We were all in shock. The smell of ozone permeated the air. Still clear skies overhead but lightning had shattered a tree, a large tree, right in front of the restaurant, maybe 100 feet from where we sat. You don't have to know the science to know lightning is dangerous. And you don't have to know the science to grasp the point Jesus is driving home. Based on experience for all of us, lightning is sudden. You don't see it coming, and you do not prepare yourself or protect yourself against the lightning when it flashes. By then it's certainly too late. So, once again, we're working our way slowly through the Gospel of Luke, and it requires us to engage in topics of Jesus' teaching that we may not think about every day. 
I'm sure as I read this, you immediately uh, categorized this text as one being about the, the end times or the last days. The theological term for this topic is eschatology, meaning literally study of the last things. It's what comes last. And if you have a great interest in the end times, you probably fall into the camp of amillennialism or premillennialism or some variation on that. What happens for many of us, though, if we have such a framework in mind for how the end times will play out, then we immediately, coming across a passage like this, we start trying to identify portions of Jesus' teaching here. Our interest in this passage becomes how it fits the overall plan. We read that one is taken and the other left. And we might think, and perhaps you thought, oh, that ties in with Thessalonians. Where the Apostle Paul writes, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And we immediately conclude that Jesus in Luke 17 is, is talking about the same event. He's describing what we call the rapture. And this is where the left behind concept comes from. One is taken, the other is left. Then we turn back to the lightning concept. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. And we think, well, how does this fit into our scenario? Is this the part where we meet him in the air and it all happens in a flash? Or is this the part where he comes to judge the world after the great tribulation? Or, or what? What is it? Remember that as Jesus is speaking to his disciples here in Luke 17, they are not familiar with Paul's Thessalonian letters or with the book of Revelation. They have not been written yet. So Jesus' disciples are not premillennialists or amillennialists or even postmillennialists. In this context, they are not thinking about eschatology the way we do. What are they thinking? Our text reveals two terms that are important in the minds of both the disciples and the Pharisees who are commonly opposed to Jesus. So, so these must be thoughts that were rampant in their society, these, these concerns. And one of the terms is the coming of the kingdom of God, the other, the day of the Lord. Remember the Pharisees' initial question that Jesus is responding to. It's about the timing of the coming of the kingdom of God. And in his lengthy answer, Jesus refers to the day or days of the Son of Man. And certainly that's going to ring in the minds of his listeners similar to the day of the Lord. It's an Old Testament expression with which all of Jesus' listeners are well acquainted. The kingdom of God, or, or in the Gospel of Matthew, the term kingdom of heaven is used, but it means the same thing. The kingdom of God is exclusively a New Testament term. It is, however... In the common thinking of Jesus' day, it's tied in with the arrival of the Messiah, the coming one promised throughout the Old Testament. The disciples believe Jesus is the Messiah. The Pharisees are very skeptical, and yet both groups think of the kingdom of God as something that will be established by the Messiah when he comes. They see this kingdom as a, as a physical, earthly government starting in Jerusalem where God rules in their time through this Messiah, the Prince of Peace. And the question from the Pharisees then as they approach Jesus, it's when Jesus, we don't know if you're the Messiah or not, but when do you think this will happen? When will we have good government at last, no longer be under the thumb of outside forces, but only responsible and responsive to God? The day of the Lord, on the other hand, that's mentioned 26 times in, in seven different Old Testament prophets almost always in describing extreme destruction or the judgment of God against sin and against nations. In the New Testament, the day of the Lord almost always refers to the second coming of Christ and specifically final judgment of sin. Jesus responds to the question about the kingdom by shedding some light on it that they are not expecting, and then he immediately turns the subject to the day of the Lord or the day of the coming of the Son of Man, meaning the return of Jesus himself. You see, they have the wrong time frame, and that's what Jesus needs to straighten out, at least in terms of their expectation of the universal rule of God on earth through his Messiah. It's not now. It's in the future. 
The kingdom of God, in that sense, is way down the road. For one thing, it cannot happen until Jesus suffers and dies. He says in verse 25, before the kingdom of God, before the coming of the kingdom of God, first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. He's speaking of himself. We read at the beginning, as they asked the question, Jesus' initial response is that the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. That might surprise them. It's in your midst. It's within you. It's among you. So in another sense, in a way that is not physically observable, the kingdom of God is here within us or among us, simply because Jesus has come the first time and his power is at work in the world and now the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in the world and among us. Jesus makes that point quite clearly in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, where he says, but if I drive out to demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he's not talking about establishing a, a, a political kingdom, a government on this earth. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, where the power of God is displayed, where God is at work, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Wherever God is working in this world, there is the kingdom. But the kingdom of God ruling on earth, that kingdom that his audience is wondering about, it's not now. In fact, what he wants them to know is they had better be thinking about the day of the Lord instead. So that's what Jesus expounds on, the last days. He says, it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. And in fact, this Greek word Jesus uses here for his being revealed is the word from which we get the term apocalypse. The earth will see very difficult days before the kingdom comes. How many times have you heard people in recent months speculating about the last days and the return of Christ. A lot more than you did a year ago, right? A worldwide pandemic. People becoming more and more violent, fighting each other, deep division between peoples, and the political climate, the political divide becoming more extreme, many of us would say, than we've ever seen it. And we are very apprehensive about what happens on election day with this deep division, what happens after the election. What will happen when a winner is declared? Are we near the end? What will the end be like? Jesus gives two examples for comparison. He speaks about the days of Noah and the days of Lot. What are the points of comparison between those two periods of time and the return of Christ in the future? Well, for one, Noah and Lot had some advanced knowledge through God's revelation. In Noah's case, decades advance warning, enough time to build the ark. In Lot's case, just enough time to escape destruction himself. Both of them must have tried to give warning, but to no avail. Noah is described as a preacher of righteousness, and scripture says that Lot was tormented in his righteous soul by what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah but people did not hear them just as they did not hear Jesus but rejected him, crucified him when he came the first time. And in both those cases, the average person in Noah's world, the average person in Lot's city was not interested in their message because they were totally preoccupied, totally consumed with something else. Now, you would think that something else that consumed them was something very, very evil. And there certainly was evil. But that's not what Jesus describes here. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. What was it like in the days of Noah? People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. What was it like in the days of Lot? People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. 
Is there anything inherently evil about any of their activity as Jesus describes it here? Isn't it the business of life, living, loving, commerce, farming, construction? Does Jesus suggest that they suffered judgment for these activities? No. Clearly, the judgment that fell on them was because of sin, because they rejected God, rebelled against God. But these activities and the people's prioritizing these things in their lives left them with no ears to hear the warning, no room in their hearts and minds to respond to God's call to salvation. The business of life totally consumed them. They had no place for God. And the most important point of comparison as Jesus uses these illustrations is that destruction fell quickly and it was too late for them. There was a time when they could turn to God, but now it was too late. Jesus says, it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside shall go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. The strong warning here is a warning that we be careful not to forfeit eternity because we have invested too much in this life. When the Son of Man is revealed, it's no time to retreat to get your priceless possessions. We know Lot's wife looked back and lost her life. She longed for what she needed to leave behind. She preferred that life to being with the Lord. She longed for what was of no value in the kingdom of God. So there's the principle, the key verse what Jesus wanted his disciples to understand, what he wants us to understand. Whoever tries to keep their life, meaning total focus, preoccupation with the affairs of this world, will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. Whoever loses their life for my sake and for the kingdom will save it. If we are living for the Lord in this life, if he is our first priority, then we very well may not accomplish everything we might have had in mind, everything we wanted to in this life. But if he is our first priority, we will be prepared for the next. So I ask you, do you think people in our day are totally consumed by the business of this life and cannot hear the good news that the Holy Spirit extends to them? Closer to home are we totally consumed by the business of life. What will happen when the day of the Son of Man flashes like lightning? Jesus describes it in his conclusion. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken and the other left. Jesus' conclusion indicates that we live, walk, and work in this world side by side with many, many people. But the truth for every one of us is you either are in the ark or you're not in the ark. You either escape Sodom or you do not escape. There will be a solid, complete, final division of humanity in the day of the Lord. At that moment, you're in one camp or the other, and it will be revealed. In a similar context, Jesus says, So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. It is too late, in fact impossible, at that time to prepare to meet the Lord. We must be prepared in advance. The external events these days, we've been thinking about them. They're causing us to wonder if the Lord is near. Let us allow these external signs to function as a call for internal preparation to examine ourselves, mind and heart. What are we consumed with? 
Let us hold this life and all its good things loosely as a gift that is to be appreciated while it lasts, a gift intended to draw us toward the giver of all good things, who is our Lord. But let's also then hold the kingdom tightly, the kingdom among us and the kingdom to come. How do we do that? Be sure you know the king and long for his appearing. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this call to re-examine our own priorities. We're caught up in the things going on in the world, and sometimes we lose our focus on you and, and what you have in mind for us and in store for us. Let us be prepared by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Now receive this blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Have a great week.